Thank you so much to Daniel for that excellent summary. Next up is a panel that will continue this conversation and explore how CBDCs could transform economies and financial systems in the future. Live Q&A is available for this session, so please submit any questions through the Engagement Hub for registered attendees under the day two live stream. Okay, as, as, as we wait for our guests to load up and on stream, uh, my name is Chris Brummer and I'm a law professor over at Georgetown University Law Center. And I am uh, just uh, delighted to welcome with me uh, some of the world's great experts on both financial inclusion, central bank, digital currencies, and digital infrastructures uh, more generally. I think we'll just go around and have each of them introduce themselves. But before I did, um, I, I did want to give a, a thanks to our organizers, uh, to, to, to Michael Barr, Adrian Harris, and others who have been involved. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll just start off with this uh, um, uh, group of luminaries for their introductions, and then we're just going to go straight into the headline questions. We'll start off with you, Lisa. Lisa Cook, Michigan State University. And and world famous economist. And yes, uh, uh, Chris uh, Giancarlo, please. Thank you, Chris. I'm Chris Giancarlo. I'm the former chairman of the US Commodity Futures Trading Commission. I'm senior counsel to Wilkie Farr and Gallagher. And I'm a, a partner with uh, Daniel Gorfine, who you've just heard of uh, as a founding member of the Digital Dollar Project, which I look forward to discussing with you in this session. This is also apparently one of the most modest sessions that you'll ever hear because uh, Christian Carl was also the chairman of the CFTC, a, a little uh, agency regulating uh, a good chunk of the financial system. Uh, Bajoy. Hi, yeah, thank you. Uh, happy to be here. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Bijoy Raskup, the chief economist of eCurrency. We provide the tech for central banks to issue CBDC. We interact with about 30 plus central banks around the world former Chief Economist of Asia Pacific at the IIF. Great to be here. Great. And then finally, Morgan. Hi, I'm Morgan Ricks. I'm a professor of law at Vanderbilt Law School and uh, previously worked at the Treasury Department in the Obama administration. And I've done uh, a fair amount of writing on CBDC and in particular the Fed account implementation of a CBDC, which I'll hopefully be talking about a bit. Wonderful. Okay, so, you know, um, it, Certainly, just just in in terms of uh, uh, Morgan's response in and of itself, I think it's good to maybe start off with some definitional uh, questions, just so that we know what we're talking about. Uh, usually, when you think about the fintech ecosystem, there are plenty of terms of art, and those terms of art uh, uh, may be used and deployed in different ways in in, in different contexts. So, from that standpoint, um, uh, 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 Bajoy, I mean, uh, has there been any progress in terms of understanding? Uh, uh, what a CBDC is, both definitionally, but also in terms of the choices in potential design features of CBDCs. So, I mean, maybe you can walk us through again, what, what a CBDC sure. is. I mean, um, certainly Dan has done a great job in sort of queuing us up. And then are we seeing even now certain kinds of recognizable patterns? Uh, yes, Chris, yes. Uh, lots of progress in the last uh, couple of years. Essentially, the question is to remain relevant in the digital age. It is clear that the central bank of the future needs a monetary instrument, which is digital, alongside notes and cards. So what is a CBDC? CBDC is a liability of the central bank, the digital equivalent of physical cash. It is part of M0 and it is fiat money. Uh, uh, and of course, it has to be widely accessible. Uh, it can be used for low volume, high value transactions between financial institutions in the form of wholesale CBDCs. And, but even more importantly, for an inclusive financial system, it can be used for high volume, but low value transactions for, by uh, for individuals and businesses as CBDCs for retail use. Let me quickly touch on some of the gains and before I talk about the two design kind of issues, in terms of the gains, uh, so wholesale CBDCs, of course, these are efficiency gains in interbank uh, and securities payments and settlements in terms of operational costs and things like that. 
But more importantly for retail CBDCs, uh, they bring efficiency gains from lower cost and instant settlement, along with expanded markets and financial inclusion. Uh, they also uh, give the access to, to the general public, uh, well-regulated uh, and state-guaranteed means of payments and helps uh, boster financial stability. Now, what are the two kind of design issues that we are uh, talking about? For wholesale CBDCs, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, our financial institutions have accounts with uh, the central bank. Uh, so operationally and policy-wise, there's not much to it. Uh, the, however, the design choices are more complex when you come to retail CBDCs. Uh, and here, there are two issues. Firstly, they can be accounts, account-based uh, where individuals and businesses hold accounts directly with the central bank. Alternatively, they can be a value-based through a hybrid model uh, where the CBDC is issued by the central bank as a digital bearer instrument. It is distributed through private payment service providers for use by consumers and businesses. So it can be thought of as a public-private partnership where, which combines both central bank and private sector innovation. And this approach is, is gaining popularity uh, with central banks around the world. Just one last uh, one point here. So the beauty of the hybrid uh, model is the private sector builds and operates the payment rails and continues to innovate, whereas where the central bank is actually providing the digital instrument that operates across those payment rails. So it's interoperable, which is great for financial inclusion, it's pro-competition, and it's pro-stability of the digital and mobile money uh, private providers. I'll stop here for now. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that's that's a useful sort of starting point, and and I know that Morgan and others will will, will have sort of more to to add to that. But you know, one is it was is I guess the the access point issue. You know, are, are we talking about um, a, a kind of digital currency that's accessible at the wholesale level or the retail level, um, as 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 we was alluded to earlier? And then, um, what kind of payment rail is it, and who builds it? As, as sort of being this the second question as to uh, whether or not you have a, a hybrid um, uh, structure. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, what are you seeing uh, you know, globally, uh, certainly, in, in terms of the kinds of design choices central banks are making? I mean, uh, you've obviously been at the cutting edge of a lot of these conversations over at the Digital Dollar uh, Foundation. But and, you know, from those conversations with um, uh, central bankers overseas and in other jurisdictions. How do you listen to those conversations and how are they comparing to how people are thinking here in the United States? Yeah, Chris, uh, you know, when I when I sort of survey the globe, globe generally, I, I see six uh, what I call imperatives that are driving central banks. And as we know from work done by the BIS, over 80% of the world's central banks are exploring to some degree or other central bank digital currency. And so as I say, I see six general imperatives. I would start with a geopolitical currency uh, influence mm -hmm. and power that comes with that. And I think that's certainly driving uh, to some degree uh, China's uh, very uh, world leading efforts in this area. But I think to some degree, the European Union as well. I'll, I'll turn to the US in a second, but just focus on the globe. Uh, in terms of uh, another imperative is concern about data, the data of financial in, in, uh, transactions. You know, if data is the new oil, uh, central banks are concerned about that very powerful and very valuable resource being controlled by commercial entities as opposed to, to central bank entities. And then a third imperative, I would say, is financial inclusion. And if we look at the work that's being done in, say, countries like the Bahamas with their sand dollar initiative, They've got a lot of very digitally uh, sophisticated residents, but actually a relatively low level of financial inclusion. And so they see uh, a digital transactions as a sort of an entry ramp into greater financial inclusion. And then a fourth imperative, I would say, is just modern digital infrastructure uh, to move from uh, analog to digital 
transactions. And certainly in the wholesale area, uh, Singapore and its monetary authority is really exploring the wholesale institutional uh, use of this new technology for less friction, uh, greater speed, greater velocity of money. And then a, a, a fifth uh, imperative, I would say, would be uh, surgical precision with monetary policy. The ability to, to uh, 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 utilize monetary policy in very precise, very targeted, uh, look at micro communities, specific areas, uh, at speed uh, as well. And then the last one is one that I talk a lot about, and that's social values. I, I really believe, and I've said this for a long time, money carries with it the values of a given society. And I think that, that China, for example, uh, with its notion of uh, social credit, um, with its uh, tradition of relatively strong state surveillance and currency controls, uh, wants control of money in order to make sure those values are incorporated. And the European Union with its strong tradition and, and legislation against commercial exploitation of data, uh, mm -hmm. wants to make sure the values of their um, uh, of their of their their laws against GDPR laws against uh, commercial exploitation of data uh, is is there as well as currency support. Now, just to, uh, briefly to take those six imperatives and, and apply them now in the U.S., the first one of geopolitical currency influence. I actually think that doesn't resonate right now with the Fed. Uh, the you know, the dollar is probably at an all time high in terms of its geopolitical influence, and I don't think the the Fed perceives a need to innovate for that purpose. Um, certainly, um, a lot of folks in Washington got real upset with the prospect of LibraCoin and the notion of financial data falling in the hands of commercial players. Mm -hmm. And I think that brought a lot of voices into the debate about CDB, uh, uh, CDBC. And also, you know, we've got a long tradition of protecting data uh, uh, privacy from government interference in our Fourth Amendment. And so the notion of data, who owns it, who's protected in it, what are privacy rights? has brought a new, uh, uh, I think, uh, 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 interest in this from, from people that are focused on civil liberties. Financial inclusion, um, I think, well, you've got folks right here on this panel that have been focused on this for years, not just uh, with the onset of COVID, not just with the onset of CBDC. And yet I think that um, um, this audience now is, is looking at CBDC and saying, how can this be a tool for greater financial inclusion that's been long a concern? Uh, then infrastructure, I mentioned before, this notion of, of tokenized digital. Well, we know that the Boston Fed and MIT is looking at uh, core infrastructure aspects of CBDC. Monetary policy, that surgical precision, um, I think nothing has pointed out the lack of precision in our account space model than COVID when millions of Americans were waiting a month or more to receive uh, a, a, a relief by paper check and over a million, a, a million of them went to dead people, we certainly know we don't have a precise, precision, surgical-like approach with our existing account space system. And then finally, social values, which as I said, is the one that, that I keep coming back to. At the end of the day, the dollar does carry with it in its global role certain social values values of individual rights of privacy and privacy in your financial transactions, provided they're not engaged in illicit conduct. Free speech uh, and the ability to you know, deploy money in a way that reflects your own personal values without state interference. A free enterprise, the ability to raise capital to build businesses. And then an air issue very important to me at the CFTC was lack of government interference in marketplaces. The reason why the, the world trusts the price of cotton and soybeans to set, be set in American markets and not other markets is because we don't have a government home team in the U.S. that steps in markets when they go down to make sure they go up the way it's done in, in certain non-democracies. Those values are built into the dollar. And I think one of the most important reasons why we should be exploring a central bank digital currency in the United States is to make sure those very values stay in the digital form of money going forward, because there is a contest underway right now for what values are going to dominate in the future of money. And I think those values that have gotten us to where we are, we need to make sure they're built in to the values of money going forward. You know, I, I want to pick up on, on that as 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 we move uh, to, to Morgan. I mean, uh, some of the great um, observations that were just made, and I think it's useful for the audience to keep in mind, is that the definition of what money is, is actually currently being 
um, investigated and refined, and 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 there are questions about what money should be, what money should mean in a world where it takes this leap from a kind of um, paper or even traditional electronic sort of infrastructure to a specifically to a to a digital one. Um, we've heard uh, Morgan conversations as to sort of two different vectors by which you can imagine. Uh, what a CBDC or how a CBDC could operate. We, we've only really thought or kicked the tires at least initially on those two questions of whether or not there's wholesale or retail payments. And then again, who's involved with building that infrastructure. But again, the qualitative features of that infrastructure itself can, can, can differ considerably. Um, we've heard a lot about values here in the United States and, and there's certainly to be a lot of elasticity uh, in the CBDC debate. Even here in the United States, depending on sort of where you're 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 looking, um, how, in your view, does the conversation on CBDCs intersect with other conversations, conversations that you've been very active uh, and involved in uh, on Fed accounts, uh, faster payments, and and postal banking? Yeah, so that that's a great question, Chris. Um, and you know, one way of thinking about this, about CBDC is, is and, and Bajoy referred to this, which is that there's a sense in which we already have a CBDC, which is reserve balances that banks and certain other financial institutions are allowed to hold at the Fed. And in uh, those accounts, they're, they're, they're digital, right? It's, a, it's an entry in a digital ledger. So it's a, it's a central bank digital currency. It's part of the monetary base. Um, and those accounts, by the way, are pretty great. You know, they offer real-time payments, really have since the 1970s. Uh, they carry interest that's higher than ordinary bank accounts. Uh, and they're completely non-defaultable, right? They're pure base money. Um, uh, but they can only be held by banks and other financial institutions, whereas uh, ordinary physical currency is, is an equal access resource. So we really have this sort of um, asymmetry uh, in at the core of our monetary framework, there are two kinds of money the Fed issues: physical currency and then uh, and then uh, bank accounts. And one's available to the general public, and the other is is for an exclusive clientele. Uh, and, and so, one way of thinking about the CBDC debate is to think about expanding access to the form of CBDC that we already that the Fed already offers, uh, which is an account based and not uh, not a bearer instrument, not a tokenized. Uh, digital currency, but an account-based digital currency. And so so uh, there, there are several, as you mentioned, there are several strands of, uh, of policy thinking that have been going on for years. Uh, one argument that, uh, that uh, both Chris and, and Bajoy referred to was the inclusion aspect of a CBDC. Um, this is an issue that we, it's really almost unique to the United States and the developed world that we don't have uh, really full bank account penetration across um, across all demographics. And, and so the postal banking idea, which has been around for many years, was really an inclusion-based argument, right? The arguments for po postal banking are expanding uh, access to the mainstream system of money and payments. Uh, the Fed account idea which I and a couple of others um, wrote a paper about a, a number of years ago, but I don't want to claim that we were the first to ever think about this. I mean, J James Tobin, uh, the great uh, econo macroeconomist, wrote a paper in 1987 uh, arguing that everyone should be able to have what he called a deposited currency account at, at the Fed, uh, which is exactly the, the same concept of just expanding access to accounts. And so that idea has been also around for a while. And the CBDC debate, as, as both Chris and Bajoy referred to, um, is, is somewhat more recent, inspired to a significant extent by the cryptocurrency, um, the, the emergence of cryptocurrencies, where, where I think what really, really set off the debate over CBDCs and then, uh, and then further accelerated uh, pretty dramatically when Facebook launched its Libra initiative. And I think that's what really, really lit the fire under uh, on banks to think about this, um, to think about these issues a, a, a lot harder than they had been previously. But these things are all sort of in some ways converging into a single discussion. As you say, there's almost a philosophical question about what money is, what's the nature of our monetary framework, how fragmented is it going to be versus integrated, uh, how available is it going to be to everyone, what are the benefits, what are the monetary, monetary policy benefits of having um, uh, having a CBDC of some sort, uh, whether it's account-based or token-based. And so we really see these debates converging now uh, 
into into more of a single unified debate. Yeah, and I'm just going to follow up with that just so that our audience can can sort of uh, for those who are new to 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 this wonderfully uh, sort of interesting uh, world is is so part of it is whether or not because we we've, we've certainly had e money. Uh, and we've certainly had also central bank digital currencies. Um, and then part of the, the, the debate, and it's not really a debate, it's more like kicking the tires to see what's, what's, what's best at this point in time, is, okay, we have new kinds of infrastructures that allow, as uh, Joy sort of hinted at, um, a kind of uh, decentralized architecture, right? And, and, and there's always been this question of decentralization, I suppose, because there's always this question as to what is the role, the proper role of, of say, private banks in money creation and the like. But that, that, that question becomes sort of supercharged when you introduce a technology that is itself sort of built on, on decentralization. And, and then you ask yourself, well, does a tokenized decentralized architecture, you know, is there something different about it when you talk about a CBDC versus what what would a CBDC look like using the current rails that we already have versus, and I think it's really important to keep these all sort of conceptually distinct. What what does it, when we, people talk about postal banking, is this postal banking in a CBDC a sort of account-based system? Is this postal banking where you put some kind of Tokenized layer on it. What, I mean, like the, the the post office in and of itself is almost a kind of a of a metaphor in, in in some in some ways because there are so many different rails that that you could um, conceivably use. Uh, um, and I want to get 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 to Lisa because she hasn't said a, a word. Um, but if you don't mind, um, Lisa, just for one quick second, I just wanted to to get Morgan's sort of take on that. You know, in terms of how you conceptually distinguish these three things that do converge, as, as, you, as you know, depending on who the person is in terms of their their sort of plan for, for an upgrade. Yeah, well, look, it's a great question, Chris. And I think, I think there's more than one way to think about this. I mean, uh, when we talk about decentralization in the context of a CBDC, you know, it's a central bank digital currency. So the word central is already there. There's some sense yeah. in which it's not... It's not yeah. decentralized in the same way that uh, that the cryptocurrencies are. Um, the the central bank is there. It's the issuer of the dollar, and it's the manager of this system at some level. Um, that doesn't mean we can't have a distribution channels that are private, as Bajoy mentioned, and and the customer interface for retail can be private. But there is a there is a centralized aspect to it, no matter what, even if it's a um, distributed ledger. Uh, but but on the postal side, I completely agree with you. I mean. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say metaphor, but 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 the post office we can think of as to the extent we need a physical interface of some sort, a branch network of some sort, which I think we all agree is sort of less important now than it was 10 years ago, certainly than 20 years ago. I don't go to my local bank branch very often anymore, uh, and I'm sure many of the watchers don't either. But But to the extent we do want that physical interface, and it is a central bank digital currency, it's an aspect of the federal government, you know, in the Constitution, the Congress's power to coin money and regulate its value is directly adjacent to right before its uh, its power to set up the post office. And those are two money payments and the postal service, our basic communications back uh, backbone are just two aspects of public in infrastructure that really have constitutional status here. And I think we can think about the post office as being a physical distribution or branch network to the extent that that is uh, is required. And, and and a virtual channel. I mean, but as as, as you noted, a physical in your neighborhood and virtual, um, uh, which is just fascinating. Uh, Lisa, I know I've made you wait. Sorry, uh, but your 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 expertise, um, particularly on these issues, is is extraordinary. Um, you know, when you when you listen to sort of these these kinds of you know the the suite of options that really um, all of the other participants have kind of laid out, as well as the kinds of questions in terms of our values and and the like. Um, what do those features tell you uh, as an economist about sort of the, the trade-offs uh, that one could possibly see in, in terms of how people are at least trying to evaluate the, the risks and the rewards of a central bank uh, digital currency in all of its many guises? I have worked on financial crises since my dissertation, since I wrote my dissertation 
in Russia in the mid 1990s. So I've always thought about what happens in economies in the extreme. And if we had had a central bank digital currency in place for this pandemic, we would not be in the shape we're in, at least partly, at least partly. I put forward a mobile money proposal at the beginning of the pandemic because we don't have everybody registered to easily get $1,200 directly from the federal government. We use tax rolls. And if you paid your taxes uh, using a bank account, then you were easily paid. But there are a lot of people who weren't. Let's start with 25% of the US population is either unbanked or underbanked. So they would have had to have found the website that Treasury wanted you to sign up on to be able to receive your money through ACH. And ACH is not as, you know, it's it's speedy, you know, but it's not as speedy as it as it could be. Uh, people were, were suffering and they were suffering very quickly after the p- pandemic started. So we could have done better, uh, say through a digital currency. So that's, that's one thing, but then there are also many people who don't pay taxes right? They don't make enough to pay taxes or for some reason they don't pay uh, taxes. So the $1,200 could have gone that would go to uh, an adult could have gone to a lot more people. A lot of these checks still have not been paid. This is this is the, the, the scandal. Uh, much after the first ones were delivered, people still haven't been paid. And we know that there are people suffering because we see these food lines that are miles long. So we could think about the well-being of people being in the hands of something like a digital currency. So that's that's one side of it. That that's that's the broad definition of financial inclusion. Typically, we're talking about sort of um, you know low-income or marginalized groups. But this is the American population, and we've got to be ready for it. We can't wait until a crisis happens for us to be. Uh, suited for that, to implement the infrastructure uh, for that. I think Libra certainly uh, put a fire under the Federal Reserve uh, to quicken its uh, its not just thoughts, but uh, ways of implementation, uh, figure out how to do this in practice. And I think that was a, a great idea. And a second wave of this is this current uh, pandemic crisis. So I would say this is one of the biggest benefits. But if we're talking about generic benefits, certainly as a macroeconomist, I'm constantly thinking about monetary policy. Anyway, we could increase uh, intermediation. Obviously, we could use the tools that we have uh, even better. And given that interest rates are near zero, monetary policy is going to be less effective. We have fewer tools, anything that can make this more precise to make it uh, work even better would be useful. So if there were any other time that a digital digital currency, a central bank digital currency would be useful, it would be now. Certainly there is the cost of processing cash. Now uh, that is, it's still a cost in the US, it's a much bigger cost in some other places. But this is something that I worked on when I was at uh, CEA and the Obama administration in terms of uh, the cost of processing cash. At some point, we're going to have to have that discussion about what we're going to do with the penny. You know, Canada already got rid of it. You know, we're, we're, we're spending more money on, on the penny. And the question is when we're going to take it out of cir- circulation. I don't think it's, uh, it's uh, whether, but when. Uh, so we have to we have to think about that. I think those are are three major uh, benefits of such a currency. Now there are challenges. Uh, certainly, again, when I think about financial crises, I think about bank runs first. And if it is an asymmetrically deployed uh, digital currency, uh, there could be bank runs and uh, the the kinds of bank runs that we see that might evolve slowly could evolve much more quickly. So that has to be managed. But every central bank that I know 
who is developing this and having uh, serious conversations is is already thinking about that. So uh, I would say that's at, at the top of the list. Certainly disintermediation, bank disintermediation, uh, where would deposits go? Now, deposit insurance obviously can take uh, care of a lot of these problems, but deposit insurance has to be evenly uh, deployed and enforced. We saw this in Cyprus. Uh, certainly a lot of the uh, Russian oligarchs who showed up with their uh, deposits in uh, Cypriot banks in uh, 2012 thought that these were going to be covered just because uh, they had a lot of deposits. Well, that's not that's not how deposit insurance works in uh, Cyprus. So, you know, you, you get these anomalies, but they are instructive. Uh, they should be instructive for how uh, central bank currency is deployed. But rather than go on, since I uh, this is uh, one of my favorite topics, sort of preventing uh, financial crises first, and then making sure that they don't do significant damage second, uh, I uh, would like to leave time for any questions that yeah. the audience might have. And, and there are quite a few, you know, uh, I, I, this is a great constellation of, of experts, you know, um, uh, I, I, just to follow up on, on, on your uh, re remarks there, Lisa, you know, um, uh, the FT's Isabella Kaminska sort of evolved mm -hmm. in her thinking, you know, ab about um, CBDCs and, and, and part of her mm -hmm. uh, sort of critique was that, okay, well, it's not even so much um, disintermediation from the standpoint of uh, commercial bank balance sheets from a financial stability perspective, but mm -hmm. what, you know, what does this do to to money creation itself to the extent to, to which those those deposits kind of mm -hmm. um, um, pick up and, and leave? And, and she's been a critic. And so, you know, I, I want to make sure that we get all those those sort of points in there. You know, mm -hmm. has that been a, a yellow flag or, 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 or red flag or flag uh, in some way in, in your thinking, um, um, uh, particularly when you when you think about that, that as an economist about that um, disintermediation question? I think, I think it's been a yellow flag. And I think that those who are doing serious research on this are uh, taking that into account. My thinking has evolved. I, I didn't believe that central banks needed a digital currency when markets work fine. And 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 the the thing that I started thinking about when all of these cryptocurrencies were showing up was we're gonna have to bail them out anyway. So we may as well have our own currency if we're gonna have to bail them out if they're tied in some way to uh to to dollars to hard currencies. Uh we are going to have to step in at some point. So we may as well uh, have one that is regulated and uh, that offers a counterbalance to these private currencies. I think that is uh, that is the way in which my thinking evolved. So it was before uh, the introduction of Libra, but uh, but certainly I think that with a balanced or hybrid system, as Joy was uh, suggesting, I think that we can get that kind of balance. And with deposit insurance, that is enforced and is uh, well written and well articulated. Yeah, but, but, uh, but Joy, and, and then I think Morgan also wanted to get in on this question. Um, you know, again, the money creation sure. question, not just from a balance sheet sort of commercial bank stability question, but, you know, where is lending coming from uh, in you know, <clears throat> when, when you do have the entry of a CBDC? So uh, let me take a shot at it. First of all, I couldn't agree more with what Lisa is saying. She's absolutely spot on. So CBDC is a public good. It's good for monetary policy. It's good for fiscal policy. It's good for financial stability. You know, uh, uh, there we are, you know, e-money, cryptocurrency, stable coins, these are all private liabilities. So mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the central bank needs to innovate and come up with a, a digital instrument for the digital age. But let me come, come to your question. So with regard to concerns, there are two sets of concerns. And, you know, I have a paper out in the conference website on we are, we are not in Kansas anymore, and all of it sort of, sort of detailed there. But the issue is really two concerns. One is banking disintermediation and the potential for triggering bank runs. Now, there are mitigating uh, issues in the design, but I'll get to that. But before that, let's not overstate the concerns 
as, as also Lisa has pointed out. So in a modern money creation a view of banking, banks do not necessarily need deposits for funding more generally to provide lending uh, to the economy. So what banks really need are central bank reserves and capital to satisfy regulatory requirements. And after that, the lending itself creates more deposits uh, in the banking system. Uh, moreover, the volume of demand deposits is typically small in an economy. Uh, another factor is that we've seen both in the US and elsewhere, the rise of non-banks or shadow banks has not undermined money creation and credit expansion by the banks in the US and elsewhere. Now, Lisa talked about trust in, in the banks, deposit insurance, regulation, supervision, and these are all backed by uh, you know, uh, the banks providing value-added services. These things do not change uh, in our uh, post-CBDC world. Uh, what, what uh, you know, another thing that should be noted is that typically retail users can switch uh, out of the banking system, switch their funds instantaneously into money market funds or government securities even today. I can go to, an, uh, to my uh, you know, computer and open and buy tre treasury securities. That doesn't change. And, and typically the, the greatest bank run threat usually comes from wholesale funding and institutional investors already have access to other safe haven assets. And now let's talk about uh, the design issues in terms of uh, mitigating concerns. Now, yeah, yeah sorry, I, I, I just want to make sure that we keep, keep going around because now we're getting a, a, a quite a few questions from, 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 okay. from the crowd and so we're going to have to uh, uh, sort just, of target just, uh, the thing. Yeah, just one, one thing on the mitigating concerns in a CBDC system, we have limits on CBDC design on, on transaction sizes, on holdings, as well as non-interest bearing or tiered remuner remuneration systems. These are easy to design, easy to implement, and that's what central banks around the world are thinking and doing. Right. So basically a calibration to sort of, uh, sort of as, as a kind of a... Uh, bulwark against the the right. capital right. Out, out, right. out of the commercial banking system right. um okay i want to i want to return to just uh some of the questions that we're getting um and and morgan you can also if you have something to add to those regulatory sort of fixes or or safeguards but but also you know uh, uh, an issue that um uh, christian garlow mentioned which was the privacy question and something that's mentioned as well sort of in the queue right um you know uh e Money, uh, whether or not whether or not you're using an account based or tokenized system, you know none of this stuff is as quite as anonymous as as good old paper, you know, uh, in the suitcase, kind of uh, for good and and for bad. Uh, but, th there, but there is this question of surveillance, whether or not when implementing a CBDC, I mean, you are by definition sort of giving new powers uh, to, uh, to the state. How exactly do you create a kind of cryptocurrency or CBDC, tokenized cryptocurrency or a, an account base, whatever you want to call it? How do you create a CBDC infrastructure, right, that provides the privacy safeguards um, that one would need in order to have a free economy? Morgan, sorry. Yeah, so look, I, I think that's I, that's a terrific question, and it's one of the big it's one of the big challenges, and one of the big things that everyone needs to think about carefully with respect to CBDC, whether it's tokenized or account based. You know, you could have a permissioned distributed ledger, you could have a permissionless uh, centralized ledger. So it's not it's not inherent in the technology, right? We could say we could do a Fed account system where we said it's just like signing up for a Gmail account and uh, and you get an account number and you don't have to identify yourself. I, I think that um, I think that would be a bad idea. I, I think that um, I think tax evaders would love it. Uh, but when you have central banks uh, uh, own infrastructure being used for law breaking, money laundering, tax evasion, terrorist financing, uh, I, I'm not sure that's a sustainable um sustainable direction. So I think some degree of privacy, uh, 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 some degree of, of identification is going to probably be needed no matter what, if we're going to do this at scale. 
and and, uh, and pure anonymity probably is not um, is not realistic and probably isn't desirable. But then it does raise questions about uh, about access to your information, about law enforcement access, and and uh, and we this is something that has to be thought very carefully about. You know, the way we do it with the IRS is we have a, a very significant privacy uh, legal privacy um, infrastructure surrounding tax information and tax returns. You know, for someone at the IRS to even access uh, your tax information without authorization or much less to share it is a is a criminal violation that can result in them going to prison. Uh, legal process, a court order has to be um, has to be granted before law enforcement can have access to tax records. And we could envision, uh, as one example, uh, replicating the legal privacy um, um, infrastructure surrounding the IRS and surrounding tax records and putting it with respect to uh, CBDC or Fed accounts. And so there are, you know, look, there are there are relatively tried and true uh, legal mechanisms for doing this, but I do think it's a very legitimate, uh, th- look, there's no way to make it as private as currency transactions. There's going to be some record somewhere of a transaction having been made, even if even if it isn't necessarily connected to the identity of an individual. And so it's inherently less private and less anonymous than a physical currency transaction. Uh, but that balance is something that's going to have to be struck if we go in this direction. And it's not an easy question. Yeah. So, can I just jump in with a, just a nuance on that? that yep. And that is that there is a fundamental difference between account-based system and a token-based system. And that is an account-based system. You must establish the identity of the parties to the transaction and the account sufficiency of the transferor and the receipt by the transferee and so you've got to identify accounts as well. In a token-based system, the difference is you don't need to verify identity. You've just got to verify the token. And that's a mathematical process of identification. Now, distributed ledger will contain that identity information, but those are design choices. How that how the identity is revealed are key design choices need to be built in. You could have a system where based upon mega data analysis, that individual identity is not unmasked unless there is certain triggers built into it. What a digital system gives you is the ability to make really precise and thoughtful design choices. You're not limited by the, the, the analog nature of the technology you can actually program in. And I think one of the most important choices that each economy, each society will have to make is where is that balance between individual privacy in, in a CBDC and government's lawful ability to surveil for per, law, legitimate law enforcement purposes? And, and here's my final point. Here's where I think the United States actually has potentially the killer app, because we're one of the few constitutional frameworks that protect government surveillance of privacy. Now, we'll have to build jurisprudence around that to really protect it, but there's a social expectation of a degree of privacy already that's built into our fiat money. So my point is, I think if we get this right, a digital dollar could could have as an attribute, uh, a reason to for patronage around the globe, the right balance of privacy rights, maybe vis-a-vis say a Libra coin where there's an expectation of commercial exploitation or a sovereign currency by a non-democracy where there's an absolute expectation of surveillance If we get a digital dollar right, I think we could have superior privacy rights and still have appropriate law enforcement interests protected. So, Chris, very, very quickly, uh, and uh, and, uh, uh, Chairman is absolutely right. So the way we approach it is uh, the the privacy part of it. And, you know, for the CBDC technology, you can use DLT or you can use another technology, which is conventional, and both work. Uh, uh, The issue really is the privacy for small transactions are protected in a hybrid uh, design. Uh, and by law, just as it is today, the privacy for large transactions may not be protected. You know, banks today have to report large transactions. And in the CBDC world, so with uh, mobile money and other providers, they'll have to report large transactions as well. Uh, so, so, and and, and uh, but, uh, but let me just follow up on, on that for okay. just one one quick second, and then I want to get to this interesting question, sort of international economics question for Lisa. Um, so, you know, w- what we're hearing is, you know, from the conversation between um, uh, Morgan and Chris is that look, you know, on the one hand, uh, we do have expectations of of privacy, certainly with our fiat currency. Uh, 
the you know whenever you get to any kind of distributed ledger technology there will be a trail of of some sort that we have a legacy regulatory structure with regards to at least our taxes that may be uh, useful in terms of protecting it's worth adding that we do have you know some real expectations um, in our BS, you know, uh, Bank Secrecy Act and and and, and other rules uh, for when you get to the money laundering and KYC uh, expectations. But then there's this extra little interesting dimension that gets back, which really takes us to the to the initial comments um, uh, to this conversation that I, I heard, I think, from Dan Gorfine, which is this question of programmability, right? And what exactly, you know, what, is, what does that actually um, mean, uh, 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 both in, in terms of the, the privacy layer, but also in terms of the larger questions as we sort of pivot a bit to um, financial uh, in, inclusion? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the question, Chris. Now, just to come back to the CBDC, you know, I, I was intentionally keeping away from the technology side because there are technology choices. You can use DLT or you can't, you may not use DLT. You know, okay. DLT has some limitations because of scale and, and things like that, and, yeah. and also the privacy part of it, there's some problems there. But on the technology side, on the programmability side, it's very, very important, two things. One is, the central bank must have the cap capacity to do the core, uh, to do the programming of the core platform. And by that, I, we talk about privacy requirements, interest bearing or not, transaction and holding limits. Now, typically uh, in a hybrid system, the AML, KYC and all of it would be done by the private sector intermediaries. Only when it crosses and trips certain uh, things like transaction sizes or something like that, only then would the, the private intermediaries have to report to the central bank. Uh, the one other aspect on the programmability side is the customer facing needs and programming that really is something that the private sector is best uh, uh, able to do and should do that. So, 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 Lisa, one of the really interesting questions you may have already seen it sort of in, in in the corner is whether or not a CBDC is good for everywhere in in the world. Are there instances where that may not be the case? That's a good question because the most compelling arguments that I was convinced by had to do with the economies I typically follow, and those are emerging markets. Uh, there was a time in Russia when I was living in Moscow when uh, it had the largest number of armored uh, armored vehicles uh, <laughs> protecting money transfers than any other place in the world, right? So you know we have several problems associated with having and uh, having cash and transferring cash, and this would have uh, addressed one of those with a credible central bank, right? So so there was a period when. Uh, the central bank had credibility, and and then that's uh, true now. Like there's credibility on a spectrum, but when it had an immense amount of credibility, uh, this currency could have replaced uh, cash. In Nigeria, when I'm in Nigeria, um, I sometimes have to carry bags of cash, and that puts, um, let's say, uh, small business owners at a lot of risk. Individuals who are just trying to make small and large transactions at risk. This could be a huge, huge boon for uh, the central bank in that regard and uh, address some other issues uh, associated with, with uh, crime, money laundering, and so on. But I think that um, it, it really depends on the economies and it depends on the times. When Greece was running out of money in one of its recent uh, crises, you know, it didn't have uh, currency, euros, to distribute uh, throughout the country, and people were stranded. Uh, visitors were stranded, tourists were stranded without access to their own uh, hard currency. So uh, this is one where one place where uh, cryptocurrency actually uh, helps. But this is something that everybody should have access to, not just the privileged few who have uh, purchased a private currency. So I would say it's not just uh, particular uh, types of currencies, but there are intertemporal changes. 
it would have been much more beneficial during the pandemic to have had this in place, right? Than just on a normal basis because we have a hard currency, right? So it, it is uh, it depends on both uh, time and space. So I think it could be useful uh, everywhere. It's just a matter of degree. You know, it's not just Greece that runs out of fiat money. We ran out of no, coinage no. here in the United States no. just a few yeah. months ago. And, you know, yeah. and, and think about it. Why does coinage even exist? It exists to make change right. on paper fiat. Well, if we go to a digital dollar, you don't need to make change anymore because it's And that's money. what I was saying about the penny. You know, you know, exactly. treat the penny goes, like Pluto. If you if you demote Pluto, you know, you you've done you've committed some tremendous crime against humanity, against space. But you know, we can get rid of the penny. You know, no, nobody's gonna miss it. They, the people haven't missed it. This corn no, shortage, no. people are taking photos of you know the US is currently having a corn shortage and everybody's looking at each other like, Oh, I didn't know that. So I so I'm know. saying that we yeah, have yeah, these natural uh, experiments. Uh, yeah. That could uh, that elucidate the uh, the kind of behavior that uh, that I think humans would display. So I think it's a, it's been a great natural experiment in that regard. So ATMs growing uh, going dry would be a historical curiosity in the digital age. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Morgan, I, I guess I'll, 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 we only have a couple of minutes left, and and. Um, you know, returning to the question of of sort of uh, um, uh, what you can do under your Fed accounts program, you know, um, uh, in, in terms of the delivery channels that are available, just sort of with what the technology, with what technology is available now, y maybe you could walk us through um, uh, uh, sort of the, the the implementation, and also again the, this question of, of programmability. To what degree is is you know is that infrastructure the one that we sort of have in place, you know, the, um, uh, uh, programmable um, and and um, accessible uh, for for other kinds of uh, future uh, upgrades. So I cannot hear you. I don't know if it's just me. No, I think Morgan's on mute. I muted yeah. myself. It could have been. Background noise. <laughs> Go. Sorry about that. So, I, like, yet again, another great question. I, I think that the um, uh, that I, you know, look, I tend to err toward keeping it as simple as possible, but no simpler um, uh, when you're talking about something of this magnitude. Uh, we want there not to be technical glitches. We don't want the rollout of this to be like the rollout of the uh, ACA exchange. Uh, we want it to be solid. And, and simplicity is important. I, I think for the most part, you know, a bank account really is a pretty simple product. There's a, there's a, um, there's a retail interface that goes along with that, but the underlying product itself really is a ledger uh, into which debits and credits are, uh, are entered. And, and we, should, we should think about not making it any more complicated than we need to. Now, in terms of, you could imagine an, OPI, an open API so that uh, uh, different companies could produce different interfaces um, for, uh, for a Fed account, but the underlying actuality of money uh, is, is a ledger system. And that's true for reserve balances now. Uh, and uh, you could make the argument uh, well, we could have an argument about bearer currency and the extent to which it approximates a ledger system. There's actually a whole academic debate around that. Um, but but I, I think I think we do want to keep it simple. I think um, and I think I can't look. The Fed has offered accounts virtually since its inception. The Fed started doing um, payments between these accounts through telegraph in the 1920s. I mean, it's been doing something uh, uh, very rapid payments electronically. Uh, for a long time. It's been doing real-time payments between Fed accounts since the 1970s. We think of real-time payments as being some uh, miraculous uh, technological innovation of modern informational information technology, but ultimately messages get sent over telecom rails that exist uh, to the ledger and the letters of debit and the credit involved. And that's, that's the core framework for how uh, a Fed account would work. And I think that accomplishes, look, it's works great for the banking system. Uh, and they, they, they love their Fed accounts, uh, their reserve balances. 
I mean, there were entities that wanted to be designated as financial market utilities by the FDOC so that they can get access to an account of the Fed, uh, not because it's a fancy product, but because it's a product that works really well, extremely reliably, very cheaply, uh, very seamlessly, and gives them perfect safety. And there's one more thing I want to say about the safety bit, because the question of bank runs came up. And I completely agree with Bajoy that um, that in the modern, and with Lisa, uh, what the Modern bank runs that are damaging to modern economies have tended to be institutional as opposed to retail. Uh, and that's largely because of deposit insurance. But runs on institutional deposit substitutes are what we saw on a huge scale in 2008 and 2009. And again, to some extent, back in March of this year. And, and one possible benefit of a CBDC is to, uh, to reduce the size of those markets, right? To the extent that CBDC is attractive. Uh, <laughs> You might see fewer institutional investors and large institutions that are cash parking going to unstable deposit substitutes. Maybe they prefer the CBDC to that. And that might actually be a good thing from a, uh, from a stability standpoint. Mm-hmm. 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 But, but Joy, do, do you, uh, well, actually, I, I want to get back to, to, to uh, the, the chairman. I mean, you know, uh, the, 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 the way and the ambition sort of uh, uh, when you look at CBDCs, it, it differs dramatically. I think that's what you had had sort of identified from the outset. I mean, what mass and monetary authority of Singapore wants. And then, you know, China, it's it's much harder to sort of read the tea leaves because, you know, it depends on what announcements are coming are coming from, from where and, and what they want to do. I mean, what's the scale of ambition that you've seen in terms of how people are conceiving in other parts of the world what a, a CBDC can or, or 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 should do. Yeah, you know, as I began the conversation, I think that there's many varied um, imperatives for CBDC. I don't. I think if there was just one driving the conversation, it would be easier to categorize the different efforts around the world. And I certainly, as I mentioned, I think financial inclusion is one of them and a very important one. I would put that almost like in the demand side. In other words, that's society seeking um, uh, greater services when it comes to money. But I also think there's a supply side. I think the central banks themselves want these tools. I think central banks themselves uh, want to modernize currency, their own currency, so it has greater global influence and, 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 and utility. And, and so I think there's a real, I think central banks worldwide are experimenting with this because they see opportunity for policy precision, policy mm-hmm. advancement, policy uh, comp- competition. Um, and so um, I, I think it would be, uh, uh, you know, it's funny, money is as much a social construct as it's a sovereign construct. I, I think sometimes the people on the official sector think they've got the whole game themselves because mm-hmm. they, they make money. Well, society is showing right now that it can also craft money and experiment mm-hmm. with money. So we've got this big kind of societal governmental experimentation going on globally it's actually i really i tell students i talk to this is an exciting time right now what's going to come out of this is going to be transformational but it's mm-hmm. complex there's many facets to it and 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 i think one needs to follow all of them to kind of see where this ultimate leads and ultimately as i said i think it comes down to values and the reason why i think the united states needs to be in the game we don't need to be first but we need to be in the game because there's some, certain values that got the dollar to where it is. And if we don't make sure those values are built into the future of money, that's going to be a net negative for our economy and our society going forward if we don't make sure those values are built into the future form of money, which the world is experimenting with as we speak. Well, I have to go and talk to my students literally right now, uh, <laughs> but I do appreciate all of you uh, for your time. And I will be sort of taking all of this great information. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just uh, fantastic to have uh, this level of conversation with with really uh, uh, many of the of the world's leading experts. So Lisa, Chris, Morgan, uh, Bajoy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and I guess I'll be passing the baton back to our organizers and hopping now onto my uh, my other class. But thanks so much, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, 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 everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.